Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the 21st season of the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus. Um, I want to give a particular thanks to our co-chairs of the uh, caucus, and that would be uh, Representative Brian Bilbray from California, Representative Charlie Dent from Pennsylvania, Representative Jackie Spear from California, and Representative Rush Holt from New Jersey for their commitment and dedication to their ongoing support of this caucus. Um, without them, the timely presentations could not ever happen. Um, I'd also like to thank Howard Hughes Medical Institute for their support of the caucus briefings through a generous grant. We are very grateful for their continued support. Um, as you can see, Tony is videotaping our briefing, and as he does for, our, for all briefings, you can find past briefings on the CLS website at coalitionforlifesciences.org. Um, once at the website, you can register for the RSS feeds in order to be alerted to future postings. Uh, now, finally, I would like to introduce Dr. Jeffrey F Friedman. Dr. Friedman received his uh, BA, excuse me, a BS degree from Rensselaer Polytech Institute and an MD from Albany Medical College. After he completed his residency and fellowship, he went on to earn his PhD in molecular biology from Rockefeller University. He remained at Rockefeller as a postdoc fellow, and in 1986, he was appointed an assistant professor and an assistant investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He became a tenured professor and founding director of the Star Center for Human Genetics in 1995, a Howard Hughes investigator in 1996, and the university's first Marilyn M. Simpson professor in 1999. Dr. Freeman is here today to discuss his research in the molecular mechanisms that regulate food intake and body weight. In December 1994, he gained worldwide prominence when his research group reported the isolation of the obese gene, also known as OB, in mice and humans. In July 1995, his group announced that the OB gene is responsible for producing previously unknown hormone, which he named leptin, from Greek word leptos, meaning thin. Also, he found in humans, leptin plays a role in controlling appetite, energy expenditure, and fat storage. His work in the area of obesity led to him receiving two prestigious awards in 2005. I'm going to probably mispronounce this. The Gardner Foundation International Award and Pisano Foundation Award. He's also a member of the National Academies of Science and its Institute of Medicine. Dr. Freeman has numerous awards and honors based on his research. With that, I'd like to bring him up here. Thank you. I don't think the news I have today is as exciting as some of the other news of the week. But I'll, it's a chance to share with you, I think, what basic science has told us about a clinical problem that is in the public eye. Um, so I don't think you need to be a physician or a scientist to realize that, the, that one of these individuals suffers from obesity. And I'd like to start with this image to invite everybody to just think for a moment about what you might think of this person and the reason the person on the left looks in the way they do or what role their parents might have had in leading to that um, appearance uh, before I uh, begin the talk. Uh, and I think at a high level what I'd like to at least plant a seed about today is the possibility or the likely possibility that what's different about people who are obese, who are obese is not necessarily the things that we normally attribute it to, lack of willpower, a toxic environment, but rather that there's a strong biological under, underpinning uh, to that. I should say it's a small enough group, so if any of you have any questions as I go along, uh, please feel free to interject them. So my objective today with this as the starting point is to try to deconstruct uh, obesity and tell you where current research stands with respect to understanding it and ultimately treating it. And I have a challenge in doing so. Uh, and that's because were I talking about any of these other conditions, which I'm quite certain you've heard about at previous caucuses, um, most people would, would sort of defer to the experts in the field if they were asked what causes these problems or how, how might we address them. That's not true about obesity, where everybody has a, um, I think, a set of convictions or beliefs about what causes it and how it might be remedied. And I think this is not uh, uh, inexplicable. I think it's because we each have such an intimate association with food and monitor our weights that we each have re reached sets of conclusions based on our anecdotal experiences and those are the people we care about. 
Now, whatever the causes of obesity or one's opinions about uh, how we might remedy it, there's no getting around the fact that it's an important public health problem, a major health problem. For reasons we don't understand, obesity increases the risk of a set of disorders, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, forms of liver disease, and even some forms of cancers that, cancer that are in aggregate the major causes of morbidity and mortality in the Western world and are growing problems in the developing world. Now, the health implications of this are illustrated in part by this slide, which is a prospective study of two million nurses. And I'd ask you to just pay attention to this magenta line, who are followed as a function of their weight using a surrogate that I'll tell you more about in a few moments called body mass index. For the purpose of this slide, just consider that as body mass index increases, so too increases obesity. And what you'll note here is that in both women and in men, as body weight increases or obesity increases, so too increases the risk of death. Now, in addition to these health consequences of obese, obese people are stigmatized that have been shown to both make less money or be promoted less readily than their no better, better qualified lean counterparts. And so the question at some level everyone asks when confronted with data of this sort is, why don't people who are up here on the curve just lose weight, watch their health improve, no longer suffer the sorts of stigma that I just described. Now, the notable difficulty um, uh, in, lo in patients losing weight over the long term is, is trumpeted uh, in the press and elsewhere. And I've capsulized the possible explanations for why people are obese and why it's difficult to, to lose weight into three general categories that I alluded to a moment ago. One possibility is, that's been put forth is that the obese lack a level of willpower that's normally exhibited by lean people. I find this point of view is more often supported by lean people. <laughs> uh, second point of view is that we live in a toxic lifestyle, uh, live in a toxic environment with a lifestyle that predisposes to obesity. Um, and the problem is largely a consequence of modernity. And then the third possibility is that this is a consequence of biological or genetic factors. Um, since the audience is small, what I sometimes do, and I'll do now if it's okay with you, is ask people to vote for which, since you're all used to votes, uh, vote which of these you think is most important. Who thinks obesity is primarily a lack of willpower? Who thinks it's mainly a problem of lifestyle and environment? And who thinks it's mainly a problem of biology and genes? Actually, I should tell you that, the, that that's the typical distribution. Few, few, uh, fewer people voted for willpower in this audience than others I've seen. Oh, you, did you vote? Question. Sure. Couldn't lifestyle environment have contributed to biological genetic changes? It, it, I think that's a really good point, and I'll sort of come to that. But I think you're making another point that I'll come to in a second, which is that these are interrelated and they're not mutually exclusive. So, so it's a false question, really. Um, but I was going to say that the only exception to that vote is in, uh, well, I don't know if I should say that. This isn't going to be on tape. Well, I'll just say it. Um, in, in Canada, everyone voted for biology and genes because that's what I, they're so polite, that's what they thought they wanted, <laughs> that I wanted to hear. <laughs> anyway. Um, I think the point that was just made is correct. If we were talking about any other problem, uh, most people would gravitate to the idea that there might be a biological basis that can be modified by, modified by environmental and behavioral adjustments or differences. But for, I think, reasons that we'll come to at the very end when I give you some quotes from the general public about the implications of our work. Discussion on this topic is, is polarized, and people tend to gravitate to a much greater extent to one or the other, or the other possibilities to the exclusion um, of the other two. So what I want to do now is briefly deconstruct for you what I believe the case is for each of these as, con as to contributing to differences in weight, starting with willpower. Now, the notion that willpower is important, while most of you didn't vote for it, is pretty evident in our culture. Uh, the message uh, is, is sent all over the place that people need to eat less and exercise more, ignoring the deeper question, which is why do people eat more or less? I think, it's, I think we have a notion that we can consciously control our intake and that by consciously eating less or exercising more, we might avoid this problem. 
Now, what this sort of set of recommendations, which are pretty rampant, ignore is the fact that the vast majority of diets are ineffective for the long-term maintenance of weight loss. And the number is probably closer to 95% of people who lose substantial amounts of weight return to that pre-dieting weight within one to two years. In fact, I got a, a, a call um, uh, in the last year that I was actually heartened by from the producers of The big, big, lo Biggest Loser um, because they were very concerned about these people and they had an, uh, an emotional investment in seeing them do well and they were concerned because most of these people do return to the weight they started at. Now there's a very good reason why diets fail and it has to do with the fact that the magnitude of our or bioenergetics, as it were, is so great as to exceed the ability of our conscious selves to monitor it. Let me explain what I mean. All living organisms obey the laws of thermodynamics, which means that energy has to be conserved. And so what that means is if our weight is going to be stable year in, year out, which it is for the vast majority of people, it means over that interval our food intake would have been precisely balanced against our ener energy expenditure. Now, in the first case, that means that over the last year, if your weight didn't change, and I'm guessing most of your weights didn't change unless you were actively trying to change it, you would have balanced precisely a million calories in against a million calories out. This numerology is even more impressive if you look over the course of a decade, where individuals will consume tons worth of fat, protein, and carbohydrate, converting, uh, converting that to weight, uh, work, uh, waste, heat, and work, knowing that weight changes in most people less than 10 pounds per decade at most. So if you do a back of the envelope calculation, what you realize is that, that, there, that the amount, number of calories you took in had to have been balanced precisely against the number of calories you burn with 99.6 or greater percent precision. This is logs better than nutritionists can do looking at a plate of food and telling you how many calories are there. And yet it seems to happen naturally for most people. In fact, this level of, ex of precision greatly exceeds the error rates on the for the calorie counts on the food you eat. This is from a JAMA article showing that the error rates could be as high as 85%, logs higher than nature appears to take care of uh, quite on its own. And I'll point out to you that actually it's the big food producers that typically have the, high, the, uh, the, the, the best record in terms of uh, precision of calorie counts. Now this sort of notion that there are vast numbers of calories that are balanced against energy burned is suggested the idea, suggested the idea that there must be a biological system that counts calories for us. After all, our nutrition is absolutely required for survival of the species. And the notion that there's a basic drive that um, counts calories is easy to demonstrate from animals um, in two sorts of studies. In this sort of study, what you do is you put a tube uh, into the stomach of an animal and overfeed it for a period of time. And while you forcibly overfeed it, the animal gains weight. But during that time, it voluntarily eats less. And once you stop force feeding it, the weight of those animals goes back to that of a control group. As if the animals somehow knew that they'd been made fat and now uh, 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 initiate a set of adjustments to return their weight to some predetermined level. And the same is true if you food restrict an animal for a period of time, of course it will lose weight, but as soon as you restore the food, the weight of those animals returns to that of a control group, much the same as most patients who lose large amounts of weight. So there's pretty good evidence that willpower can lead to weight loss over the short term, but over the long term, its, its efficacy is pretty limited. What about lifestyle and environment? Well, this is the sort of quote you would often read, one would often read about in the paper, no age has ever afforded more instances of corpulency than our own. This was Thomas Short in 1727. Now, what this illustrates is, first of all, that obesity is not a new problem. And second of all, it, it amplifies the fact that I think most people consider it to be uh, an, ex an especially prevalent problem today, an epidemic as it's often referred to. And the sort of evidence that people use to support this uh, looks like the following. People, we measure obesity, as I'll tell you, based on this metric BMI, which is weight over height squared. And what you basically can do is say that in 1999, for example, 27% of the U.S. population exceeded this threshold versus 15% in 1976. And so people argue our genes haven't changed over this interval, so it must be the environment. 
First of all, this premise is wrong. Gene frequencies can change very rapidly in populations over a short period of times. But that's not actually the point I want to make. The point I want to make is that this numerology is, um, is I think, uh, or the, the conclusion that obesity is increasing to the extent that people suggest it might be depends on how you look at the data. And I want to give you now a different way of looking at the data that I think leads to a different conclusion. And the problem with the sorts of analyses that I just cited is this. Obesity, or body mass index, is a continuous trait. By that I mean if you look, it's weight over height squared metric, and if you're 5 foot 10 and a man, and you weigh 167 pounds, this is your BMI 24, at 202 pounds you're 29, at 242 you're 34, 7. Now, while there's a huge range of BMIs in between these extremes, and BMI is designed as a surrogate for how much fat you carry, we define these conditions, overweight or obese, as a fixed threshold. Now, there's a problem when you define a continuous trait like this as a fixed threshold, and that is that if this is a distribution, the distribution doesn't have to shift very far to get a disproportionate increase in the number of people who exceed the threshold. Let me show you what I mean. This is the BMI cutoff of 30. This is a schematic representation of the BMI in 1990. The average BMI was 26.7, and 23.3% of the population was obese. In 2000, the average BMI in the US was 28.1, about 7 to 10 pounds higher. But now, because the threshold didn't switch, 30% of the population is obese. What this means is that over a course of a decade, there was a 33% increase in the incidence of obesity. But this was associated with an average weight gain of 7 to 10 pounds. What I would like to suggest is that you get a very different sense of what's happening when you hear body weight increases, obesity increases by a third in a decade, versus hearing average weight went up 7 to 10 pounds, which is in the realm of people's individual experience. There are fluctuations. Moreover, the data that's been shared in the course of the last few decades is not typically corrected for age and sex. And when you do that, it turns out the distributions in that same decade aren't anywhere near as different as you might have surmised hearing the simple statistic. So here are the data for ages 40 to 59 for men and women. Uh, I have the, other, the data for the other um, ages. And, and all of these data were provided to me by the statistician who provides all these data to the National Institutes of Health. Um, and uh, I think her view is the same as mine, which is that the extent of the change over time is nowhere near great, as great as is often publicized. Now, I don't want to ignore the environmental contribution because clearly there are in increased numbers of individuals above this threshold in 2000 greater than 1991. And we certainly would like to understand what are the environmental contributors to this increase in obesity, which I should tell you is different in different populations or different uh, people of different ethnic origins. But in addition to this environmental question, there's another question embedded in the data that I found, find more interesting, which is this. In our environment today, we all have free access to calories. We can all eat as much or as little as we want, and yet weight in 2011 is highly variable. People can weigh hundreds of pounds more than other people. Why is weight so variable in an environment where everyone has essentially unlimited access to calories? And the, the answer to that question is to a very large extent genes. Now there are a number of ways of assessing the genetic contribution to a particular human trait. I won't summarize all the various methods, but I'll just tell you that the classic method is to systematically compare pairs of identical and non-identical twins. This is one such study from Sweden. And what you'll note here, of course, is that the monozygous twins are much more alike than are the dizygous twins. Now, since the monozygous twins share environment and genes, and the dizygous twins share primarily environment, if the monozygous twins are more similar, we can assume that's because of a genetic contribution. Now, some people say, well, it may be that twins share a more similar environment, but studies of this sort have even been done in, in identical twins who've been reared apart because of adoption. And the conclusion is the same. This is a very, uh, uh, this, this trait has a huge genetic underpinning. In fact, the heritability, uh, and I'll define what that means more precisely now, it means the extent of the variation that can be attributed to genes for obesity is greater than that 
for many other traits that we, consider, we generally consider to have a genetic basis. Greater than schizophrenia, diabetes, hypertension, alcoholism, heart disease, and exceeded only by height. Now, the objective of scientists, or many scientists and work you may have heard about, is to try to understand what is the nature of these genes. And by understanding the nature of these genes, can we learn more about the system that regulates weight and accounts for obesity? To illustrate the power of these genes, I want to return to the image that I began by showing you of this young boy who is described by Steve O'Reilly and colleagues in Cambridge, England. Um, this child was of normal weight at birth, but he began to develop morbid obesity in infancy. He overweighed voraciously and was already pre-diabetic at the age of four when he weighed 90 pounds. Now, this child came from an inbred pedigree. His parents were cousins, and this is often an indicator that there's um, uh, 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 associated with genetic alterations. And so it was the case that this boy had a, an, an equivalently affected eight-year-old cousin, girl cousin, who weighed 200 pounds. An eight-year-old child weighed 200 pounds, which is what I weigh. All right, 210 pounds. But it... <laughs> Now, O'Reilly, when he saw this appearance, noted that there were features that this child shared with a strain of animals that we've been we'd been studying for almost a decade, and which had been supported by NIH, both at the Jackson Laboratory, it was first identified, as well as supported our efforts to, to study it further. This is a picture of the Obi mouse. It's obese as a result of a defect in a single gene. And so the only difference between this mouth, mouse and its sibling litter mates is, um, uh, is a defect in a single gene that weighs it, leads it to weigh about three times normal and have five times as much fat. And similar to the children I just described, this mouse ate voraciously. Now my laboratory had set out in part with NIH support uh, to identify this gene, and in 1994 we identified the gene as encoding a novel hormone, which as you heard we named leptin. Leptin is a hormonal signal made by fat that reports the aggregate fat mass to the brain so that adjustments in food intake and energy expenditure can be brought to bear to maintain constancy of fat. And I'll tell you more about how this system works in a moment or two, uh, but first I want to tell you that what we had found was basically this OB mouse is, uh, has a defect in the gene for leptin. And so the question is if the animal has a defect in this gene for leptin and we give it leptin back, what happens? And what we were able to show is that the weight of these animals was markedly decreased with leptin treatment. So this is the mouse given a saline injection. This is the mouse giving a leptin injection. Now, so what this begins to show in animals, at least, is that one of the two elements that we attribute to willpower food intake, because the animal eats less, is, um, is regulated by biological factors. But in addition, we were surprised because we also saw that the other part of the equation was also regulated. Here's a picture of an OB mouse given leptin or saline. And what you'll note here is that this mouse hardly moves at all, and this mouse moves normally. And this is actually evident even before uh, the animal has lost any weight. So what was exciting to us was that both of the elements of the system that we typically attribute to conscious control, food intake and, and activity, were, um, were um, regulated by this hormone. Now, O'Reilly noted these similarities with the child that he was studying, and so began to give leptin to the children. And here's what happens. The child gets older. This has nothing to do with leptin. That's just the way things are. This child, despite getting taller, got thinner. His fat content got lower, was less diabetic, and the child ate less. Before the first leptin injection, this child at a single meal ate 2,000 calories. That's the number of calories an adult of my size would eat in a day. This child ate in a meal and asked for more. After a few leptin injections, the child now ate 180 calories. This is now a picture of the child at the age of eight. These are the images I began by showing you. It's the same child. So what's different about this child, what, what, what's driving obesity and appetite in this child is not a lack of willpower. It's not a toxic environment. It's a lack of this hormone leptin. And as I'll tell you uh, at near the end of the talk, uh, the incidence of a genetic alteration accounting for obesity is quite high, much, quieter than, uh, qu much higher than people uh, generally, um, uh, generally assume. Now, based on this work and others, now I should tell you that leptin mutations are rare. 
There are only a few dozen such mutations worldwide, which is not unusual for hormones. And I'll tell you more about um, other causes of obesity in a minute. But first, I want to tell you that over the last decade or two, we've learned that the system um, that regulates weight uh, functions something like this. At our stable weight, we have a certain amount of fat and a certain amount of leptin, and our food intake precisely equals our energy expenditure. Now imagine that our weight loss falls because of an illness or a diet. Less leptin is made, and low leptin is a stimulus to eat more. And so in the presence of a low leptin, food intake will increase by, because of unconscious, unconscious drive to eat until such time as fat mass and leptin level returns to the starting point. If now um, you go on a binge of eating and your weight increases transiently, this will lead to the production of more leptin, and the leptin will now act on brain centers that regulate appetite to suppress food intake until again such time as fat mass and leptin level return to the starting point. Now by such a mechanism, uh, you, this biological mechanism essentially ensures that weight is maintained within a relatively narrow range. So, this establishes a biological force that resists either weight loss or weight gain, which to the point that was made a little bit earlier, has important evolutionary considerations that we probably could talk about at the end if people have questions. Now I'll come to in a minute the fact that we don't believe leptin is the only factor that regulates weight, but nonetheless it sets up a biological force that's critical for regulating food intake unconsciously in all mammalian species, including human. Now what's wrong with the leptin deficient child is that he has a defect in the leptin gene. So, so the fat doesn't make the hormone. This child actually is obese because he thinks he's starving and so eats more, burns less, makes more and more fat, but can never make the signal that shuts the system off. So this child now is an example of an individual with what's, with what's referred to as a leptin deficiency state. And there are other leptin deficiency states that are associated with human disease for which leptin treatment is as effective as it is for this, this child. Most obese patients, however, do not have leptin deficiency. In fact, if you measure the blood levels of leptin in most obese patients, the, the levels are high. Now, high levels of a hormone in the setting of a, of a, of a condition such as obesity uh, often indicates that you're resistant to the hormone rather than deficient for it. And the classic example of this is adult onset diabetes where most diabetics actually have extra insulin rather than an insulin deficiency. Um, and what this means when you have a high level of a hormone is that the hormone you make doesn't work well enough for some reason. And the way this leads to obesity is something like this. Imagine you have a certain amount of fat but now there's a block to leptin action as was evident with the child, you'll, you'll eat more, burn less, make more fat, and make more leptin. So essentially, by dialing down your sensitivity to the hormone, you'll increase fat mass and dial up weight. So the question that, that we're all interested in, as I'll come to, is, well, what regulates leptin sensitivity? But before telling you the answer to that, what I want to tell you is that, that you might also ask the question, well, what happens if you give extra leptin to, to patients? Does it do the same sort of thing for, for people in the general population with obesity as it does for the leptin deficient child? And that question was first asked um, 15 years ago, and there was reason to believe back then that there were, uh, in this, uh, this experiment, what's done is patients are given leptin at these different doses and you're asking, do they lose weight? And what you could see is that some patients lost weight and others didn't lose weight. And there was some excitement at the time about leptin as a, as a, as a generic treatment for obesity. Um, but it turned out that this, the number of people who respond was sl somewhat lower than the number that was suggested by this study. And so because of that, the development of leptin languished. More recently, however, there have been reports that if you combine leptin with other weight reducing agents, uh, you can get pretty prominent weight loss. And what's shown here is a combination of leptin and another hormone called pramlantide, which is a marketed drug for diabetes. And this combination now actually led to 13% weight loss in patients in two clinical studies, uh, which is quite significant and which at least, you know, uh, I think raises the possibility that leptin could be part of a therapeutic regimen in the future. And so this combination is now in clinical development as a possible treatment for obesity although, of course, its further development requires that it be shown to be safe and effective. Now, as a scientist, what we're most interested in 
uh, at least in my laboratory, is to understand how leptin works and what causes leptin resistance in the first place, the idea being that that might give us some clues to treatment. This is going to be a difficult uh, uh, problem to address because it will require that we understand more about the nature of the neural circuit that, that leptin acts on to change appetite and then understand what's different about leptin's ability to activate that circuit in the obese state. Now, in the last decade, we've learned a lot about how this system, this behavioral system is wired and how it works. And I'll just give you a snapshot of this by telling you that in the brain, there are classes of neurons that either increase or decrease appetite. This class of neurons is inhibited by leptin, and this class is activated. So that if you, are, if you, if you have no leptin, the neurons that activate feeding are maximally active, and the neurons that, have no, that, that decrease feeding are off. If you give extra leptin, you activate the neurons that inhibit feeding and fail to stimulate the neurons that, that, uh, that, inhibit, that activate feeding. So this provides a molecular basis for understanding the neural circuit that regulates appetite. And this also forms the basis for new treatments because by understanding this circuit, it raises the opportunity in time to intervene and activate the pathways you want and shut off the other pathways you might want to. The reason this neural circuit has attracted so much attention in recent years is that mutations or genetic defects in it cause human obesity. And we now know that more than 10% of morbid obesity is a result of defects in one of these four genes. Leptin, its receptor, another peptide in these inhibitory neurons called MSH, or the receptor for this peptide, which is called the MC4 receptor. 10% of morbid obesity is the result of a genetic difference that's already known. In the rest of the population, I believe there are other unidentified single gene defects of this sort, as well as a com in other patients, a combination of genes that account for the higher heritability I shared with you. So when I say 10%, what I mean 10% of morbid obesity is a result of a defect in only one gene rather than a combination of genes. Now the biggest question I think that faces us is to try to understand where this circuit projects its signal to to really regulate feeding. So we have a discrete number of cells in a region of your brain known as the hypothalamus that change food intake. What happens in between? And I raise this because feeding is a complex behavior. What this means is that many factors influence the likelihood that you'll eat, but none guarantee it. So in addition to leptin and other such signals, sensory factors, emotional factors, and even higher cognitive factors, such as the conscious desire to gain or lose weight, are relevant to whether or not you start to eat. Not only do we not understand how complex information of this sort is represented in the brain to regulate behavior, we don't even know where it's represented, meaning where it's integrated. And so one of the great challenges for the future will be to understand how various factors are, are processed or information from various factors is processed to make a complex decision such as whether or not to eat. Now, while there's, there's great mystery and fodder for future research to understand this neural circuit, I want to close by telling you what, that what the science of the last 15 years has told us is that body weight is to a large extent regulated by a classic endocrine circuit or a feedback loop composed of a signal, of a signal in the form of leptin, centers in the brain that process this signal, and a set of physiologic effects of that processing that regulate food intake and metabolism. This system works a little bit like a thermostat. Your brain sort of sets the level of fat you ought to have, and then, this then you sense the amount of fat you have by sensing the amount of leptin your fat produces. Now, this biological framework provides a basis for now asking another set of questions, which is how do environmental or behavioral factors influence the function of this circuit? And I'd like to suggest that if we're really going to understand how environment acts, we're going to need to understand the biological substrate on which it it, it, um, it, it uh, has its effects. I also think that, that it, un further understanding this system is going to be required to develop better treatments for obesity. This is the sort of the advice obese people get these days. They should basically eat less and exercise more. This advice was put forth by Hippocrates 2,000 years ago. And I'd like to suggest that modern science ought to be able to do better than simply repeat a 2,000-year-old recommendation that didn't work very well then and doesn't appear to work any better now. So rather, I would like to suggest that we approach this problem the same way we would any other medical condition. 
define the molecular components of the pathways that regulate weight, understand what's different about this biological pathway in the abnormal state, of course, consider how environmental, lifestyle, and devel developmental factors influence that, the function of the system, and from this develop uh, rational therapies. This is the procedure that was adopted when, in the war on cancer, and it takes time. It took almost 30 years between the time when the war on cancer was declared and the first non-empiric therapy for cancer. But I think this is the standard way in which we move forward to develop new treatments. Now, I'm often asked, well, what would you tell people in the, oh, was there a question? No. What, what do you tell people in the interim? Because obviously it takes time to use this new understanding to develop drugs. And so the advice I give to the obese are actually, this is actually the same advice I give anybody else. The focus should be not on cosmetics, but on improving health. This means everyone should exercise and eat a heart-healthy diet. What's important, however, to also note is that one does not have to normalize, quote, normalize weight to improve health. You get a disproportionate health benefit with modest, achievable weight loss. This system doesn't regulate weight to the pound. It sets a range for people. And most people could get, can reap an enormous health benefit by smaller, achievable amounts of weight loss. And I think the problem that we run into now is that many people are not satisfied with this amount of weight loss because of the stigma associated with obesity. So I think if we could somehow convince people to focus on their health and not stigmatize obese people, it would allow them to, I think, uh, uh, meet achievable objectives and improve their health. And then finally, don't berate yourself if you can't normalize your weight. You're fighting against a, bio a powerful biological system. And of course, don't berate anyone else either. Now, I put some of these thoughts in a Newsweek editorial a year or so ago. Uh, this was the tagline, uh, the real cause of obesity. It's not gluttony, it's genetics. Why are moralizing uh, misses the point? And I have to say, it, it, it generated an incredible amount of discussion on the Newsweek uh, site. It was the number one commented on article for a week or two. It, it spawned chat rooms. And in closing, I thought what I thought I would do is share with you some of the reactions of the general public uh, to what this mess to, to the message I've tried to share with you. This is crap. <laughs> what a complete load of apologis apologistic crap. I have like 30 pages of these, and it was really interesting to hear the different ways people could describe something as crap. Ditto to the hogwash. Empowering obese people with yet another, another excuse is reprehensible. How many before or after ads for weight loss, diet, and exercise are there? Do they work? Sure, if you want to. Fat is as fat does. This is my favorite. What turns out, you have, I had many detractors, but a few defenders. I smell smoke wrote, I'll bet Dr. Friedman's buddies don't call him skinny, but my defender T. Misan said, and I bet smoke's buddies don't call him smart. <laughs> Another person wrote, I don't think how I live my life is anyone else's business. My obesity is not hurting anyone else. I often wonder if people vilify obese people because they're so visibly obvious and nothing makes you feel better than pointing out the mode in someone else's eye. And here's the, the one I actually thought was, was most telling. Someone wrote, are we animals or do we have an intellect and the ability to choose how we behave? I mean, I think everyone at some point realizes that there are many things that drive our behavior. There's what we might want to do and what our biology tells us to do. I think for I think reasons that are more sociologic than scientific, people want to believe that we choose how much we eat and how much we weigh. But I think the available evidence says that we don't have as much control over that as we would like to believe we have. Um, and that doesn't uh, mean we're animals. Uh, on the other hand, it does mean that, that we are biological organisms who obey uh, the laws of biology. So I'd like to stop here and take any questions you might have. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, going back to, to the example you mentioned that, um, of the boy who was eating 200 calories in one meal. Um, so I understand that um, because of his um, reduced leptin levels, um, he just had a much larger appetite, and his appetite couldn't be satisfied until he had eaten all of those calories. But um, let's say he grew up in an environment in which, um, you know, when his parents saw that he was eating so much in order to satisfy his appetite, 
even though he would be hungry after a normal sized meal, they would tell him, okay, you know, like stop now, you can't eat you know, all of that food at once, right? And I think we've all had um, experiences in which, you know, we wanted to overeat or something like that. And, you know, growing up, our parents would tell us, okay, you know, at this point, you're eating like a pig, you know, stop. Um, have, have there been any studies on what happens to lectin levels when um, you know, individuals grow up in an environment in which they're, they're sort of taught that satisfying such a large appetite is not normal? So in this particular case, the parents did almost everything they could to restrain the child's out, output intake, including actually padlocking the refrigerator. And the child just figured out a way to get food all the time. I think the issue here really is that we all have the experience of how somehow being over, overeating or having the sense that you know, we've had too much and it's time to stop. But I think it's, a, it's, it's not correct to assume that that's the same feeling everybody gets when faced with a meal of similar size. I think that, that if you were starving, it would be very hard to convince you no matter what, or you thought you were starving, it would be very hard to convince you to stop that meal midway because there, for some arbitrary reason. And that's the feeling these children have, and I think it's the feeling most obese people have when they start to lose weight. It's the sort of drive you would have if you'd lost, let's say, 30 or 40 pounds or were dangerously thin. Now to your other point about can environmental inter interventions or behavioral interventions of that sort work, well, I, I'm not here to tell you they can't work, but there's been no sort of uh, large you know, larger scale uh, em dem study or behavioral study that's been shown to be effective in children or others. In fact, the available studies say the otherwise, say otherwise, that they, they typically don't, are not successful at affecting uh, long-term weight loss. So I think whatever um, strong recommendations you might give your children in that regard don't appear, one might give their children, don't appear to, to do the job you would like it to do. Question. Now, um, you said before you had the statistics, 75 to 90 percent of diets don't work in the long run. Um, is that because people just go off them and stop doing them? I mean, yeah, that so. seems to point to behavior instead of genetics. Okay, so this sort of relate, I meant to, to mention this a moment ago, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, probably, there are some people, maybe five or 10 percent of people who can maintain enormous weight loss over the long term. So it's not that 100 percent of people return to their pre-dieting weight, the vast majority do. On the other hand, and this is why I like to show this slide about the complex behavior, uh, we're not metaphysical creatures. And so what that means is that in those patients, volition may be sufficient to overcome the basic drive to eat over the long term. Now those patients actually report that they always feel hungry and they constantly have to sort of avoid, you know, consciously the desire to overeat. Now I think in the long term that may be explicit, explicable. I think, you know, our conscious selves or our verbal selves are situated in one part of our brain. The basic drive to eat is located in a different part of the brain, and the way these connections are set up may be different in different people. And so there are some people in whom willpower can overcome any basic drive, and other people it's, it's, it's less effective. And for obesity, which is such an important a reflection of such a basic drive, the drive to eat, most people cannot use volition to, to overcome it. But I mean, you could ask yourself this question about anything, about drug abuse, about alcoholism, about many behaviors where there's a, conscious, a basic drive and a conscious desire. And I think it's worth asking yourself the question, which generally wins for most people? I think the basic drive generally wins. If and when patients are taken off the leptin treatment, do they maintain a healthy weight or do they return um, back to a unhealthy weight? They go right back to the weight they started at. So the, you Regardless need to, of how long they've been receiving the treatment? That's right. And it sort of relates a little bit to the last question. When patient, the, in, the, in the minority of patients who can maintain long-term weight loss, the sense of hunger, as I understand it, never gets better. Meaning this, is, this system is designed to really monitor your calories, so it doesn't sort of auto-correct over time. Um, you address uh, like behavior and how much we eat, but you don't address what we eat. So how would you sort of address that? So, that's a really good question. So some of you may have seen these books. Um, one book you'd see the, the, the Atkins diet, don't eat carbohydrate, that's the treatment for obesity. Then there's the Pritikin diet, don't eat fat. 
I've never seen a book that says don't eat protein, but it's probably out there somewhere. <laughs> and it underpins a really important question, which is, does it matter where you get your calories from? Are there certain types of diets that are more, that will predispose more to obesity than, than other types of diets? The answer actually for people is not known and may be unanswerable because of the difficulties of doing such studies. So I, I could, I have a bias. I think that, that all, a calorie is a calorie because they're all interconvertible in the body and it doesn't matter where you get your calories from. But the precise answer in people has never been tested. And the reason actually all these, these studies of diets are so difficult is that typically you can get so few people to maintain the weight loss lo long term that you need enormous studies to say show a difference between low carbohydrate and low fat diets. So I think uh, I have an opinion on this matter, but there's no data that can really address it. Uh, yeah, research shows that breastfed babies tend to um, be taught by sort of that nurturing process to regulate, to self-regulate their feeding. And as a result, that later on in life, they tend to shut off their feeding and appetite when they're full rather than continue to eat even though you know they're, they're full when compared to other groups. So I was wondering with regard to the lepitin if there would possibly be an interaction between people or children who have been breastfed and then those lepitin levels and those individuals. So what we're talking about is a neural circuit and neural circuits develop over the course of our lifetimes but particularly so when we're infants and, and in, in utero. Now there's a lot of research into how factors both for the pregnant mother and the newborn child might influence the development of this circuit. And I think what it's fair to say is that there are some factors that probably do influence the circuit and modulate it, although I think the effects are relatively minor as compared to the sorts of mechanisms I'm talking about. So. Um, I don't think those sorts of mechanisms for, could, for example, explain why people can vary by hundreds of pounds. But it might contribute in some way, as do many other things. Um, but I think the really, what, let me put it this way. I think the more obese, this is an irony, actually. The more obese someone is, the more likely it is to be genetic. So in a way, the people who get stigmatized the most are the people who could, about, you know, who could do the least about it. Um, and the people who get stigmatized the least, you know, are people like me, where I could probably lose five or ten pounds and be healthier, uh, but I don't get around to it, and so no one bothers me. And I have another question. Thank you for answering that. Um, to what extent is this lepitin treatment available to the general public? It's not available. It's in clinical trials now, and whether it becomes available or not will await the outcome of further clinical trials. Going back to the very first question, talking about the, pers the parents uh, regulating the number of calories, what about people who may have the leptin deficiency and are in environments where you do not have unlimited calories? Have we looked at that to see how, I mean, you can't eat what's not there. You don't have to padlock yeah. anything. So this sort of relates to this issue of, you know, you know, evolution and selective pressure. So nobody gets fat in an environment where there's no food. And in fact, the argument has been made that it may be that in those sorts of environments in our ancestors' history, gene variants that lead us to eat more and more evolved as a way of protecting you or getting you through, uh, through the famine. And so I think these are some of the evolutionary forces that shape how our population evolved or how our species evolved. And that sort of argument has been used to explain why there might be more obesity today. Because now a population or a species that never got enough calories is getting enough calories on a genetic background that's designed to deposit the calories because that is fat because that's what protects you from the next famine. Now with respect to the mouse, no one's ever done this experiment with the human children, but with respect to the mice, even if you food restrict those mice, they're still obese. They're not as obese as they would have been otherwise, but they still are obese. And I'm quite confident that would be the case for the the child as well. Obese meaning increased amounts of fat. I have a question. Uh, just want to take it a little bit different. Um, some of the uh, patients that we see that have the bariatric surgery as a treatment for obesity, has anything been, have, have you looked at the background, you know, with what you're talking about with the environmental, the psychological, leptin, and the influence and seeing what the interaction is? 
Okay, so bariatric surgery is an effective treatment for morbid obesity. It's probably the only treatment that's out there. Um, it's not a perfect treatment. There are potential side effects of the procedure. And in addition, the patients who have this procedure, while they lose weight, still on average r remain obese, which I think is pretty extraordinary. You do a procedure that leads people to eat maybe 1,000 calories a day, yet the average BMI for these people after the procedure is still, would still qualify them as obese. I think if anything, that tells you uh, that there's probably a deeper explanation for why obese people are so than just a lack of willpower. Because even when you enforce willpower in that way, they become obese. They now seem, they seem to find a way to get increase so, their calories. Yeah, a lot of patients do, and they 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 there there are a lot of people sort of because of I think this biological drive um, get around it. Now the other question is why does the bariatric procedure work? Originally, scientists or surgeons thought it worked just by altering the anatomy. There's a, a evidence, however, now that, that what the, ch the procedures do actually is they change the other levels of other hormones made by your gut that also regulate appetite. And so I think there's some intense interest in now trying to figure out what that cocktail of other hormones might be um, that could replicate maybe non-surgically what the bariatric procedures do. And I should tell you that the, the other hormone that was combined with leptin for the treatment of obesity came out of considerations of that sort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, I guess it's, I don't know if this is a question for you to ask, but um, do you see any way moving forward from a scientific perspective to change some of this public perception that you have embodied up here in the Newsweek comments? Because I think it's, it's clear from the comments that maybe a lot of the reason that the research on leptin and that there's so few commercial leptin therapies has a lot to do with the perception that, you know, if you're a company investing in, you know, leptin therapy, that you're really just trying to make, you know, the next FenFen or something like that, that it's not, uh, you know, there isn't that perception that it's a truly unique therapy designed for people who have a serious problem that they might not be able to overcome any other way. Well, I think, I think the, the FDA does a, a, you know, a very good job and a very critical job evaluating the safety and, and efficacy of these things. So I don't think the, you know, that's the problem, although the costs are so high, it's, it's clearly a major consideration. But I think as far as public perception, there's something you know, I think worth thinking about, which is that there are huge interests in communicating a different point of view. The diet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, uh, and they're not going to make a lot of money by telling people to start our diet, it won't work, right? In addition, um, I think the pharmaceutical community, uh, there are other vested interests that have an interest in fanning the flames of this epidemic to create an environment where they can now provide the remedies for it. Uh, our PR budget is rather small and limited to events like this in a Newsweek article. So I think that's a good question. I mean, you'd be better equipped to answer that than, or deal with it than I would. That is how you know, how does, how does a scientist like myself and others who work on this topic get the message out? I, I, you know, I'd, I'd sort of welcome your input on that. Yes. Considering that leptin is a product of the fat cells, what is the effect of, uh, in people, for example, who have liposuction and, and, and destruction of fat cells? So I, there was just a New York Times article on this that I would... So I knew, until recently, I knew the answer to that in mice, but now I can tell you the answer uh, in human, which is if you take the fat out of one place, it grows back elsewhere, as if the fat is growing back because your body wants more leptin, and it will provide the signals that will now stimulate more fat and allow you to make the more leptin to sort of re, re, reach equilibrium uh, again. There are some environmentalists, some new new work in toxicology that show that some early environmental exposures, I mean chemical exposures, in early life or in utero may be responsible for obesity later in life. Um, have you looked at, at that at, at, with respect to leptin and the effect that an environmental exposure might have on the fat, whether it produces more or less leptin? So I think First of all, I don't discount the possibility that there could be developmental factors that influence how this circuit develops and could make a difference. The available evidence that I know of has not shown anything other than maybe a toxic agent that has a dramatic effect. Now, 
Could there be toxic agents that do this in some people? I mean, until one knows what they are, it's hard to, to say, to discount it, and I, I certainly wouldn't. I think if there are such agents, it's much more likely that they act on the brain regions that receive leptin signals rather than the, on the amount of leptin the fat cell makes. Um, the fat cell, yeah. So I, I, and I think there are precedents. That, well, let me put it this way. There is a region, if you take the region of the brain on which leptin acts and ablate it, in animals or in humans who have tumors or sarcoid or other conditions, you can get massive obesity. So we know that, that changing the anatomy of this neural circuit can have a dramatic effect on weight. Now, it's a fair question to ask, could a toxin do that? I'm sure it could, uh, but I don't know of any particularly compelling evidence that, that, that such toxins are a cause of obesity in the patients who are massively obese. But that doesn't mean it, it couldn't be the case in some. Um, just quickly, have you noticed that your research is having any effect on where research dollars are shifted, or is it having the impact in the public health community? Because right now, there's so much focus on environment, 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 and doing things in the environment that promote health. But if you and your research are saying that genetics maybe is the driver, then are we misspending money? Well, that's a really great uh, question. And I, I'll tell you my opinion, yes. I think that, here's the thing. I think everybody makes the assumption that the way to treat this is to tell people, eat less, exercise more, or some variation of that as a public health policy or as a treatment regimen. I think it's a fine idea to suggest that. But getting that to work is a research question. It's not a given. For example, I've heard other stories where you monitor a patient's activity and that becomes, people just say that's the way to treat it. That's not the case. There's never been a, a public health study that shows over the long term that you can have an impact in patients. And so these are research studies. And I think that, um, uh, that it, 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 a balanced portfolio, I should say, it, you know, is going to be important here. And I think with the, part of the drivers of this is, is if you believe this is an epidemic that's just spiraling out of control where in 10 years everyone's going to be obese, well, of course you can't take the normal course of you know, research leading to therapeutics. You need to do something now. And I think that view that this is a spiraling problem of just ever-increasing dimensions leads you to try to design regimes, regimens that will work in the short term or that you hope will work in the short term. But I, you know, I think over time history has taught us that the long-term view and the basic understanding is really the, I think, the, the linchpin of, of, of new treatments. And after all, I think you could ask yourself in every such case, you know, what's different about this than the recommendation Hippocrates made? Is there any effort to develop a test, a blood test, sebum leptin levels? Well, I think the only reason you would do a blood test for, there is a blood test for leptin. The only you typically won't do a medical test unless you get actionable information from it. And the only actionable information you would probably get right now is whether someone was leptin deficient. So few patients are leptin deficient. I don't, there are instances where you might want to measure it, but they're pretty small. I think there may be uses for it in the future. If leptin develops as a therapeutic, you might be able to predict response based on the blood level. But we're not, we're not there yet. Um, first, I, I just wanted to see if uh, you'd agree with the statement that um, genetics is um, a major cause of obesity, but not all people who are obese are, are so for genetic reasons. Would I agree with that? Well, I would agree with that to the extent, you know, having to do with the question before, that there could have been some developmental ins insult or something else. So a patient who develops a pituitary tumor that that um, destroys the part of your brain that responds to leptin would not have a genetic basis. Now, if what you're asking is, are there people who are obese where it's purely behavioral or purely some... Even because of depression or something like yeah. that. Some people you know, become obese after medication. Oh, well, yeah. medication for sure. Yeah. So that's a great or example. Or even after, you know, yeah. emotional trauma or something like that. I, I'm sure that can happen. And certainly, antipsychotic medications can cause enormous weight gain. That actually restricts the use of antipsychotics for many patients because they put on so much weight. Well, where do those drugs work? On the same neural circuits. So it all sort of comes together, and all the evidence suggests that our weight is regulated by sets of nerve cells talking to each other with different chemical mediators. And 
in some cases, drugs increase weight by changing that circuit in one direction, but the hope is that other drugs will emerge in time that have the opposite effect. What, what about purely lifestyle? Yes, you know, but I, I don't think it's the major cause, but I can think of instances where lifestyle could ins So maybe I'm being a little too orthodox about this, so let me try to, to explain it this way. I, I think, I don't discount the possibility that I think you're attracted to, that it would be a great idea to keep people from ever becoming obese in the first place, and that it may be easier to prevent it by controlling your children's intake or activity, that it may be easier to do that than to reverse it once it developed. And I think there's some scientific evidence to support that line of reasoning. The only problem is that I know of no studies that have been successful in keeping children who appear destined to be fat from becoming fat. And so the interventions that have been applied, you know, in different places that I know of at least, have not been effective at changing weight. So I think if, you know, despite the fact that their intentions are good um, and uh, there's a scientific basis for thinking it could be a tremendously powerful way to go, what remains to be done is actually design a regimen that, 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 that works. And, and that's been the hard part. It doesn't seem to make a difference. It sounds like what you're saying is that there's a genetic mechanism that basically sets an equilibrium point, uh, and that equilibrium point will be different for different folks. But the uh, flip side of that is that thin people stay thin. Uh, if fat people stay fat, thin people stay thin. So it would be interesting if there are any studies on how, much, how often there are changes. Um, yeah. In either direction, either uh, either overweight to thin or thin to overweight, because that that backs the, backs the question of like, well, why why does, why does the change ever occur at a different age? Yeah. So first of all, I think your description of this being an equilibrium point for different people in different places is 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 accurate, and it's probably some words I should have inserted. I think I think one of the questions that. Um, that always troubled me was this issue of some people who are thin all their lives and become massively obese later in life, at a point at which the system should have had a full opportunity to act. And there are explanations for that that lead me to say what I said in response to the last question, which is that it might be easier to prevent it than, than reverse it. But there are other ways this could happen too, such as um, dysfunction or, or loss of particular neural populations could also account for it. So I don't have an explanation for why someone's weight could change very dramatically over time, but I'm pretty convinced that there, would, that there's, there will in time be explicable biologic explanations for it. So just because we can't explain it doesn't mean it's not biological, it just means we don't know enough yet. But, but that may just be my bias. <laughs> oh, you didn't ask a question. Oh, well, what's the typical amount of time uh, for a relapse? Somebody who's had a, you know, excuse my voice, that it's had a dramatic loss of weight. Because I had one a few years ago and I want to know if I'm out of the danger zone. <laughs> okay, so I would say, you know, it's quite likely or possible that you're in that five to 10%, because you look pretty lean. Um, yeah, I lost about 60 pounds. Yeah, so first of all, that's great work. Uh, but I'm one of those outliers, so like I, my case does not. I also think, we don't understand, I think exercise seems to really make a difference, but there's no, there's no evidence that exercise by itself will work, but anecdotally it, it does appear that people who effect long-term weight loss typically have exercise as an important part of their, their program. Is well, that I, true for you? Yeah, well, I, I, went, I joined the Peace Corps, I went to another country, yeah. I hiked for 50 miles a week, so yeah. I, my body adapted to meet the demands of my environment, and then when I came back, the, you know, my willpower and the, the routine was so strong in my mind, it's kind of affected my life ever since. I mean, but in a, in a way, this sort of illustrates what I tried to uh, communicate at the beginning, which is that we all have our personal experiences, and we basically draw our conclusions based on the experiences you might have or your family might have heard about through you or other people. But I think anecdotes of this sort are useful because they help you ask a question, right? Yeah, sorry? But, but you can't, right. So what you do as a scientist, I think, is you look overall and try to provide uh, a basis for understanding, for incorporating all the different experiences. And we're nowhere near that point yet, but I do think we have a framework with which to begin to ask questions like that. But as far as you go, I, I, I think there's reason to be very optimistic. Thank you. Some of those um, genetic potential changes that you mentioned, uh, may affect, uh, 
the looking pathway. Is, is there evidence that, they, that the rate of mutations varies across populations in the world? Uh, no, which, I which, is, which is leading to the, why would there be different obesity rates in different countries? Oh, I think, yeah, the, 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 the gene frequencies in different populations are different, and there may be some element of which populations had the fewest number of calories in, in the distant past, predisposing to obesity now, and our job now will be to try to figure out what those variants are, but the progress there has been a little slower than we might have liked. And I guess my question is a little along her lines. When you look at minority health disparities and trying to achieve health equity, you notice that disproportionately ethnic minorities are obese. And I'm really not comfortable with this whole idea of pockets of people being genetically different than other people because historically we've done some really ugly things with those presuppositions. So what really is the answer to that as this ties to your research? So I, I, you know, I, I think all popula populations have have genetic differences. Now, what that doesn't mean is that there are gene variants in one population that are not in another. That's not the case. Rather, what happens is that each population has its own hodgepodge of or collection of variants, some of which may be higher frequency, some of which may be lower frequency. Now, the, the, the notion has been put forth that each population you know, has its own history and its own experiences that shape which variants they carry, and that could lead to population-based differences. So I'll give you a classic example of this. The most obese populations on the planet are typically Pacific Islanders. Now, Pacific Islanders are thought to have had a particularly vulnerable uh, history to famines. Every time there was a typhoon, there would be no food. And it, it turns out that those populations presumably uh, had an advantage in having a high frequency of genes that allow you to deposit a lot of f food as fat and survive a famine. Those people were not obese in times of famine, but now when given free access to calories, those populations become particularly obese. And that's the sort of line of reasoning that explains, now not everybody in that population gets obese, but more get obese in that population than others. And they have their own particular history that carries with it a particular set of variants. Now, I believe that's the case for all populations. Um, each has its own history. Each carries them with it. Each has, you know, good and bad things. So I, I, I don't. So well, we're trying to fix an unfixable problem. No. Well, I don't believe that. I believe. Would you have said? Would you have? Would you say that about cancer? Thirty years ago, they said no. I think we have a framework for understanding this. And the framework provides lots of opportunities. And I think there's a, a scientific opportunity now to take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you. Doesn't that sort of also link back to, I forgot who over here said something about what you eat. And because one of the things that I've noticed, if you look at some of the recommendations, in, in, in not dieting, but in the diet, for the types of foods and the source, say, of your protein or what have you, and if you try to follow some of these things in terms of the quality of the foods that we have, it's extremely expensive. The so-called bad foods are really cheap. You know, $2 for ham two hamburgers, cheeseburgers, whatever the case may be. And people sometimes have to adjust their diet to their economic position, et cetera. And I, and I, I feel there's some influence there that um, which kind of goes along what you say about the Pacific Islanders because they, their diet was to eat a lot in times of feast because there were times of famine. So there, there's some interplay between the, the, the amount and kind of calories that you take in. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And but let, me, let me draw a distinction there. So what I'm talking about is whether the different components of your diet influence whether how likely you are or are not to become obese. That's different than whether or not you get heart disease. We know that these sorts of things are bad for your heart health. And so I'm not advocating eating the sorts of things we know to be heart unhealthy. I'm just simply saying that, that there's no evidence that those things also by themselves cause you to become uh, uh, obese. Okay, That's why I said eat a heart healthy diet. But um, 
the evidence is really lacking about whether or not these different diets differentially, you know, cause weight loss, for example. There's certainly no evidence that they do. Well, thank you, Dr. Freeman. Our time is up.